Hi everybody. So here I am. It is Sunday. It is six o'clock by my reckoning, but I know that it is, what's the word I'm looking for? Daylight savings time. So for some of you, this might be late or confusing or something, and I'm sorry. I didn't realize when I picked the day that it was, uh, it was also daylight savings. I am sitting in my empty office building. It's a little strange. I think I am the only person in the whole building, but so I'm talking into the void. <laughs> uh, so I'm hoping someone is there on the other end. Hi. <laughs> um, so today uh, I had high hopes to go to a NaNoWriMo write-in. I'm, uh, I'm not a NaNoWriMo participant. I've never been able to do it for various reasons having to do with November being the worst month ever. So, but I, I thought I could go to a write-in and kind of say hi to people and see what it was like. And, and so I was super excited. So I had this quest to go to this write-in and uh, it was at the Doe Library in Berkeley. And it just turned into the saga of driving in traffic for hours and not being able to find a parking spot. And so eventually I just turned around and left <laughs> and came back to the office. So <laughs> Ty says that she is there, has a, uh, Ty says that there's a list of things. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, Ty. But I thought you said they were mostly spoilers. Um, yay, everybody's here. Um, yeah, the whole NaNoWriMo thing was uh, a bust. So I'm not surprised because, frankly, every time I've tried to do NaNo, it's always been a bit of a bust. So maybe next year. Next year will be the charm, I hope. So... Anyway, we're going to do a and a I'm hoping you guys have some questions, but I did get a few ahead of time from people, so I can, um, I can start us off with a few things. Look at my extremely pretty notebook. I'm very proud of it. Um, oh, good. So we have some non-spoilery ones. Non-spoilery questions. So the idea is, uh, my policy on spoilers is anything's fair game if the book has been out for at least a year. Um, which means that Romancing the Inventor is not fair game, but uh, neither is Poison or Protect, frankly, right? Because that was half a year ago. But, um, uh, what was I saying? Uh, sorry, you guys, it's been a long weekend. Um, the, uh, yeah, so, but anything prior to a year is totally fair game. So no Imprudence, no Poison or Protect, and no Romancing the Inventor, but everything else is fine. And, uh... Yeah, you should be caught up by now if you're bothering to watch me do a Q&A for an hour. <laughs> um, but then after this, I'm going to bop over to the Spoiler Squee group real quickly and do another quick live, maybe just like 15, 20 minutes or so, uh, for actual spoilers. If anybody really wants to talk about the plans that I have and the spoilers that are afoot, you can follow me over there after this. Um, but I wanted to make sure it was in that protected environment because I know people really don't want spoilers and I wouldn't want to do that to anybody. So let me see, what were my questions? So I'm sorry I didn't write down who wrote the question, but I'll just say the question. Uh, so somebody wanted to know if I had plans for books set prior to the finishing of school series. So for the first time, no one's ever asked me this before, but on the other Q&A I also got this question. People asked me if um, I would ever write about Connell before Alexia, so like when he was married, because when he was a human he was married and had kids, obviously, because there's Sid Haig, who's the great, 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 great granddaughter. Um, and I'd never actually even thought about that. Uh, I think it would be really hard to write because I, I feel like you guys as readers would be kind of frustrated seeing him with somebody else um, because they're so perfect for each other. But I, I can't imagine doing that. I, I do, so I, the, the first part of the question, which is just writing things that are set earlier in time, say in the Regency area, yeah, I'd love to write more Alessandro stuff, but I had always thought of writing, writing Alessandro rather than uh, Connell. I never really thought about Connell. And I could see writing some other of the werewolves, maybe backstory, or even sort of some Lord Apeldama backstory. He would have had a, a grand time in the, in the Regency or in the Georgian era. Um, so Lyle, for example, I could see some of his past coming back to haunt him. But I'd never thought about Connell. 
and now that you've given me the idea, I'll uh, I'll keep it in the back of my head because that's one of the reasons I do Q and A's like this. You guys, obviously, is you give me great ideas, so I gotta file them away. People will often ask me if I'll ever be done writing in this world, and I'm like, I just have endless story ideas, so I doubt it. <laughs> uh, yeah, Lord Akulama backstory would be really fun to write, um, but probably only as shorts, you guys. I can't imagine spending too much more time <clears throat> in his head, even if I'm writing from like a drone's perspective. Just being around him is kind of exhausting for me, so I can't imagine writing much more than just a short story. But, ah, Jesse would like to know more about Channing. We did um, talk about this briefly in the other Q&A that I did uh, on the launch day on Tuesday, and I am planning to write a Channing novella. Uh, with giving him a nice lady, or a not-so-nice lady, because <laughs> she has to be tough enough for him. Uh, and I'm hoping to write that next year. It's on the long list, but it's it's definitely slated, um, so that's my intent. I, I don't even have an outline or anything for it yet, so I'm not going to make any promises, but Channing is definitely, I definitely have my eagle eye on Channing. I really, you can see, at least I hope some of you can see, that I've, I switched it up a little bit with Channing. I wanted him, I wanted you guys to see Imogen, see him as a more sympathetic character, because obviously he and Alexia don't like each other whatsoever. But Imogen and he kind of had a little moment of understanding, and that was an opportunity for me to showcase that he was a more um, well-rounded character than you thought he was. So, Because I always knew. He has, a, he has a decent streak in him. It's just going to take some time getting it out. Ty wants to know if I've ever written something not from outline form. Yeah, so the recent um, piece that I've written that's going to come out next uh, next year, mid-year, in July, which is the um, the gay urban fantasy paranormal romance that's set in modern day in the Bay Area, um, that one was almost entirely without an outline. And it was just because it woke me up in the middle of the night and I just started writing it. And then I was having so much fun, and because there was just no pressure whatsoever, because it wasn't even in the same universe somewhere, I didn't even think I would ever publish it or anything. I uh, I just let myself do whatever I wanted. Now, of course, I, I've decided I am going to publish it, so I need to go back and rework it. But I have a pretty solid kind of mental pacing outline for romance now, at least the pulse points of romance, if it's going to be a straight-up romance first rather than kind of a more adventure plot or more steampunky plot. So, and, and so that, like, I can hit those points. I can hit a relationship journey and make it exciting, I hope, uh, pretty instinctually now. So there's a ro there's an outline, but it's kind of like in the back of my head. Um, yeah, uh, so, so yes, but it isn't common. Although, I will say every book is different. So some, like Poisoner Protect had a very skinny outline. It was almost just like uh, ideas, like a single sentence for each chapter. And some books have way more complicated outlines. I have a feeling that the next Custard Protocol book is going to be a pretty complicated one. Jessica wants to know, hi, sweetheart. <laughs> What's one of... What's the thing that I enjoyed most about writing Romancing the Inventor? Um, and what's the thing I hope most people will enjoy about reading it? The thing I most... So... Uh, the thing I most enjoyed about Romancing the Inventor, I think, is Imogen's voice and personality and the fact that with her I got to write a... Um, a working class character, which I've never really gotten to explore before. I mean, there have been working class characters in my books, but they've never been the point of view character that I'm writing from before. And so that was... Super exciting for me, and also exciting for me to write a character who kind of, um, kind of knew who she was, but, but, and what she wanted, but was thwarted by her own station in life more than anything else, and her her own position as a woman. It's more honest, I guess, to the historical time period, which I kind of got to avoid dealing with this kind of thing with my aristocratic characters because the supernatural imposes a certain level of autonomy or preternatural. Um, and money, of course, gives you a lot more leeway um, in getting away with things in an impo in a like a socially strictured society, which Imogen didn't doesn't have those advantages. So writing a character that's disadvantaged like that was pretty fun. Um, and what's the thing? I hope you guys. I hope you guys enjoy seeing um, female female romance, a, a, like a romantic comedy. <laughs> I guess is what I wrote. Um, and I, the more I read in 
the romance genre, the more I am hungry for diverse romantic main relationships because they're relatively rare. And female-female seems particularly rare to me. I mean, there seems to be certain niches for lesbian romances, like uh, suspense is pretty popular and even kind of mystery and noir with the romance element. But um, just a sort of straight-up historical romantic comedy seems a little, little rarer. So I kind of want to... It's me, so I'm always trying to write something that I think that I think fills a gap of what I want to read that no one else has written. So that's that's one of the things I, I did with this book that I hope I hope everyone enjoys reading about. Am I ever gonna... <laughs> Isaac wants to know if I will write more marine biology. Yeah, the book that I is coming out in July is the follow-up to marine biology. So um, it's a the thought experiment about what happens when Alec, who's the main character in marine biology, who's the alpha werewolf, but who's like a nerdy, uh, gay, marine biologist <laughs> who just happens to be an alpha um he meets and falls in love sorry guys spoilers i warned you he meets and falls in love with the merman in that book and this is the story about what happens when he takes his merman boyfriend and his pack his new like young east coast pack to and they move to san francisco because they want to be in a place that's more accepting uh, but San Francisco and all of the supernatural creatures in the Bay Area have these preconceived notions about werewolves because they have the reputation for being red, sort of rednecks and stuff. So they have to, have to sort of fight. And it's it's Alec is in the book, It's it, but it's not his story. It's his brother's. His brother is the main character. So, yeah. So marine biology, yes. Jan, uh, hopefully July. <laughs> Ty wants to know... If it's a, you, you could ask, but I and I can just say, Ty, that it's too spoilery. Uh, that will be my answer, and you can save it, and we'll do it later. So ask away, and then if it doesn't work, we'll we'll wait till later. Liza or Lisa wants to know if we get to hear about how Quinnell feels about Imogen someday. I mean, I think, so he's away at university. He's young, but he's gone to uni early, which happened in the Victorian era. If you were smart, you went off when you were like 16 to university. Um, he wants to know, so he will have known about her, and she'd kind of been a sort of stepmom in a strange way. Um, she doesn't come up in... Well, frankly, because she didn't exist in my head yet in um, either of the Custard Protocol books, although Genevieve is mentioned as still being a drone. And so RTI, like, ties into that. So, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, if, if I need to, they will meet. But, um, so there are so many characters already in the Custard Protocol book that revisiting the adult characters has to be done pretty judiciously, and I can't introduce too many of them at once. So even though you guys know them, new readers to the Custard Protocol series might not. So I don't want I don't want too many names from the past rolling around. It gets a little too self-referential, and I don't it can come up as kind of like pedantic or and I don't want to edge into epic territory where there's just so many bazillion characters people have to start keeping lists and lists and lists. So, um, she might not, I don't know, if, if I need her, <laughs> if I need her, she'll reappear. But I gave them, at the end of Romancing the Inventor, I gave them, I mean, this is not a spoiler, because it is a romance novella, so you guys know there's a happy ending, I should hope. Um, but I gave them an ending that I felt like they would both love, like a, a future that they would adore, and so, um sort of activities of Rue and her crazy crew is gonna, are going to be pretty non-impactful <laughs> on those, which is fine. They need some peace and quiet. Who, who doesn't? Who's my favorite minor character from the Parasol universe? Mm. Um, well, I really love Lord Akeldama. I've said it before, and I'll say it again because he's just so easy to write. So when he has a scene, it's just easy for me to write. I really love kind of silent, what I would call the silent but deadly characters. Uh, so those are characters that people love, I love, readers really relate to, but they actually have very little screen time and they say very little or nothing at all. So Flute is a great example of that kind of a character. Virgil is another good one from the Custer Protocol books. They tend to be quietly capable because I, I very much admire that kind of personality, so I tend to 
have characters. Bumber Snoot is another one of those characters. They have so much personality, but um, it's a test for me as a writer because I rely on dialogue. I love dialogue, and um, so characters that have little dialogue become a challenge because I must use description to get their personalities across. And description, when you're writing with a single point of view character, is always colored by your character's point of view, unless I introduce the narrator as a third voice, which I did do in Solace and a couple of the other books, but mostly I don't. So it's always challenging as a writer to get across how I feel about a character through the lens of the point of view character that I'm writing from. Um, and those characters like Bomber Snood and Virgil and Flute, um, they are, uh, yeah, they're fun and challenging because of that. So I, I tend to really like those. What is the most challenging thing I've found writing about hive life from day to day? Well, it was interesting, an interesting thought experiment for me writing Romancing the Inventor to think about what the hive was like during the daytime when none of the vampires are around being annoying and willful and demanding <laughs> and snacking all the time. So um, that was kind of part of it. And also building a aristocratic household that kind of functioned the way an actual Victorian household and staff would have functioned, but um, also imposing this this uh, external model of what a hive is like in my head on top of that. So that was kind of, it was really enjoyable actually. I, to a strange extent, um, I, re I really wish I'd had more time to <laughs> to kind of be in the hive. In, in the novella, but one of the reasons for me to do these novellas is to keep them really quite tight. So, don't have time to waffle about and talking about hive life, etc. Am I excited by my trip to Singapore? I am. I am also one of those people who kind of doesn't get excited about a trip until I'm actually there. And I don't know why that is. Um, my partner's super like into reading up on the place we're going to be visiting and drawing like getting maps and drawing like coming up with ideas of things we're going to do and I'm kind of more just relaxed and I, I I I don't know if it comes from my archaeology days you sort of end up there and then see what happens and decide what's exciting and what food you want to eat when you're on the ground as far as I'm concerned um, and the other side of fact about this is that I don't really have a chance to get either excited or nervous about the trip because I had this launch um, that just kind of took over my, my world and my life, so I didn't really have a chance to think about uh, anything else. Uh, and maybe that's not a, not a bad thing. Um, I'm not a nervous flyer or anything, so I'm not perturbed about the flight. It's, eight, it's 17 hours and 45 minutes or something. Um, it's like one of the the longest flights you can take that's non-stop. Uh, but, dude, I can sit and entertain myself for 18 hours with no problem whatsoever. That, that's an advantage of being a writer. Jess says she loved seeing the outsider view of Alexia and her mannerisms. I must say that that part of Romancing the Inventor, I really, really enjoyed writing. Uh, I think it's one of my favorite things and one of the reasons I write these sort of shared books in the same universe where you can have a main character turn up as a side character and it's, yeah, it's so fun, just so fun to write. It was so fun to write Prudence's opinion on her mother because can you imagine having Alexia for a mother? Oh my God. And it was so fun to write Imogen as a complete outsider observing not just Alexia but Alexia and Genevieve interacting with each other uh, because again totally different perspective and yeah oh god it was so much fun to write. Ty wants to know how Channing and Imogen's relations came about. Um that so I talk I, I don't know if I've really talked about this but one of the things that like I don't, I don't consider myself a writer who really gets writer's block or anything, but I do have these kind of crystal clear moments of kind of inspiration or um, epiphany or something, that, and that's the juncture I know I can write the story. And those crystal clear moments are usually a very vivid scene that I can see in my head. 
So with Soulless, it was the scene where Ivy and Alexia are walking together in Hyde Park, and Ivy uh, is shocked by Alexia's blasé attitude to having had to kill a vampire the night before. Now, that's not the first scene in the book, but that's the scene I saw in my head. And with Imogen and Romancing the Inventor, the first scene that I saw in my head was that confrontation with, or non-confrontation, conf God, I can't speak tonight, um, with Channing outside that tavern. And I could see, you know, the Sorry, guys. I'm literally downstairs sitting on top of my wireless router so that so that <laughs> the connection is better, but the device is telling me the connection isn't great. Anyway, so that, that scene with Channing was the first one. Um, and at first it was just kind of Imogen and then this werewolf uh, approaching her and understanding her in a way because... Um, because immortals have so much more life experience, they're, I think they're more intuitive to um, what mortals are going through in a very odd way. Uh, they'll admit things more readily than a mortal will because they've seen it all before. And so, and then in that moment, I also realized it was Channing who was observing her. So in a strange way, that little scene was the sort of beginning scene that told me that I could write the whole book. Um, and that gave me kind of all these aspects of Imogen's character and personality. Uh, sorry, I'm scrolling back through. I'm not sure I'll get to everybody's questions, but I will try. Why did I try to... Oh, why did I use a single po point of view? So just Imogen for Romancing the Inventor, whereas I had two. I had um, Gavin and Prussia in Poisoner Protect. So I tried it with Genevieve. Uh, when I first wrote it, I was doing a swapped POV back and forth, and frankly, it just wasn't working for me. There's no other way to put it, and there's no scientific way to put it. I'm sorry. Occasionally, my creative brain just takes over, and the creative brain basically said, this isn't, this is Imogen's story to tell from the get-go, and just wouldn't allow Genevieve to have her say. Um, and there's no, like, there's no more complicated answer, I'm afraid. Do I anticipate the appearance of Professor Braithwaite? I thought about him recently, actually. I can't remember under what circumstances. I think I was looking at some pictures of Dartmoor. Um, but no, I don't. I think he turns into this kind of bo boogeyman of the Moors for um, that part of, of Dartmoor. Story about Alexia Collins. The Hedgehog Incident. Uh, alias Meet Cute, <laughs> because I'm so witty. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would like to write Alexia and Connell's meeting story. I haven't quite figured it out in my head yet. I mean, I know he sat on a hedgehog, that's part of it, but how did that come about? We must keep the hedgehog from getting injured. Was it an actual live hedgehog, or was it the statue of a hedgehog? These are questions that I must ruminate upon. I actually have an arrangement to go visit some hedgehogs uh, early next year. <laughs> Because I want to have an interaction with a hedgehog to find out. I mean, I, I've seen videos, obviously. and, and I've, But, uh, yeah. So, if perhaps it will happen. Uh, climbing back into Alexia's brain would be a challenge. So, mm, yeah. That's a lot of work. More work than you think. It would only be a short story, though. Um, given the opportunity, what would I choose to conceal in a crocheted octopus? Well, tea, obviously. Uh, it's... At any given point in time, there is usually a tea bag stashed somewhere on my person, which actually turns out to be a difficult thing for Singapore because I just put the bag. I don't have like labeled bags or anything, and I had to go through all of my various kits and things that I use for traveling and take out all the unlabeled bags of mysterious leafy stuff because uh, apparently that can get you into trouble in Singapore. So far as novellas for side characters, uh, Katrina would like to propose that I do one around Lord Uncle Thomas' cat. <laughs> that's a hilarious idea. Oh my god, that's descending into a level of sublime comedy. The calico one that murders the, ta mur murders the tasseled pillows. Oh man, I, this is another one that I never even thought about. Um, I don't know. I could probably write the mind of a cat, but I'm already facing that challenge with Tesheret in the world, so.
Ty wants to learn if we're going to l- ever learn about Lady Lynette's background. So she's one of those characters. A lot of the teachers um, are those characters that I actually th- thought about for Delightfully Deadly novellas. So I want to do the main side characters first. And if those novellas are still like selling well and doing well and uh, I still want to write them, then I could certainly see doing some of the uh, teachers as in novella form, giving them some of their own stories for the Delightfully Deadly. And also I'd really like to write uh, Dimity's parents' romance because, you know, they're a star lover, a Bunsen boy and a Geraldine's girl. So I think that would be really fun to write. <laughs> it's not going to be enough. If I write a story that stars a POV cat, you guys, it would be a short story. It'd never be a novella. <laughs> Can you imagine 40,000 words in a cat's brain? Craigie. Talk about Spoo. I love Spoo. Um, I love Spoo and Virgil. They're two of my favorite characters in the um, Caster Protocol books. It would be fun to write about them sort of later on, given that they're having this crazy childhood growing up. Um, Spoo is many things. A reminder to Rue and... um, and her friends and Percy and Primrose that they're adults now and that they probably should take some responsibility from their actions. But also a reminder to the readers that there's this underbelly of the Victorian world, which I treat very, very lightly, but involves child labor um, in a big way. So, you know, and I, I also have another side to that, which is I believe in giving kids responsibility. So in a strange way, like, of course, I'm against child labor, but I also think like kids ought to not be too coddled and they should have responsibility and and jobs. And I started working when I was seven years old and then I was like the town babysitter for years. So I believe that kids should work. Um, So so that's that's kind of spoo. (laughs) A bit of both. Do I ever have a difficult time explaining the science side of the parasolvers. You know what? I've never really tried to like up and explain it fully. On the blog I've hosted a couple of like guest authors who come in and like do long diatribes on sort of how the science might have worked. I do know exactly how the science works in terms of etheric interaction with uh, human skin and blood in terms of um, excess soul and immortality and metanatural and preternatural. So I have it all kind of science, pseudoscience. I mean obviously doesn't really work but it does in my universe um I have it all like charted out but because a lot of that stuff is still kind of yet to be revealed or it changes slightly I've never scanned it and put it up on the net if I ever end up completing it like feeling like I've told everything in terms of the because I use I reveal parts of my world um, as kind of plot points sometimes. So I, I intentionally ne- try never to re- do a lot of info dumping where I'm just describing how the world works. I'd rather you and I figured out how the world works together with our characters, which is why um, Prudence is completely unique and why Alexia knew so little about herself because I wanted us to discover it together rather than me just telling you about it because that's boring. Um, so I, But I do know it all. Um, I had to figure it all out if we were going to discover it. I just haven't written it all out in all of the books yet. Um, But at some point, once I feel like what I know has been adequately sort of distributed via the story, then I'll probably put the the actual data up in the wiki or something so you can all see. Uh, (laughs) Katie says, all her head comments belong to us. What's the hardest scene situation to write in Romancing the Inventor? Hmm. Well, the nookie scenes, I've talked about this, I always find them the most difficult. It was actually, they're not very graphic in Romancing the Inventor, and they were actually easier than I expected. Um, I think because Imogen's so comfortable with herself, and there was this underpinning of humor between the two of them. So, yeah, I don't know what was the hardest. I don't, I didn't, like, I didn't really struggle with that book. I, I don't feel like I had too much just seem to come, it just seemed to work. This is a, a, the pleasure of the novellas is they seem to come really easily uh, to me. Yeah, nookie is my favorite word too because uh, it's a very delicate way of saying what we all know I'm saying. And I'm afraid I'm probably missing things. <laughs> what was the hardest scene? We got that one, all the headcanons. Will Lorde fall in love again in a future story? 
Um, I guess the real question, you guys, is whether Lord A ever falls in love at all. Um, at least as we think of it. I think he's so old at this juncture that he just has a different concept of love. I've always been incredibly taken with the Greek idea that there are multiple forms of different kinds of love. Romantic love, as well as platonic love. So we tend to think of it as just these two, which is kind of strangely limiting, whereas the ancient Greeks had all of these different ideas about the different forms that love could take. And I love, and I love, I love that. <laughs> I adore the idea. Um, and I think Lord Akeldama doesn't love in the way that most humans experience romantic love uh, because he's, because he can't, he couldn't let himself uh, because they're all mayflies, all of his drones who he adores, but they're, he, most of them will die before he does and he knows that. So that has to be a very different way to go into any kind of a relationship. So, um, I got very philosophical. The preternatural from the north. Ty wants to know, um, is he ever going to come into the fray? Well, I have been thinking about him. He's in the back of my head. But, um, without spoiler alerts, I can't really talk about, uh, what he's up against. So, that might be something for the squee discussion later. Are we going to meet more soulless? Ah, uh, yes, there are more soulless. Um, uh, yeah, that's a spoiler question. Um, Sabrina needs to be caught up on my books. <laughs> we'll just say that. Um, Alexia currently, because it currently stands as the only female soulless. But I don't, there might be more, but there, most of the men, rest are men. Um, we would get a short story or novella about the marine biology boys. <laughs> I just answered this earlier in the talk, uh, Colton. But the uh, book, and it is a book, ah, the novel, that I'm releasing in July, hopefully, if everything goes smoothly. Uh, I'm gunning for, I think, July 17th, which is the Tuesday before Comic-Con. Um, is the follow-up novel to marine biology. So you will see those boys again, and that's where you'll see them. Yes, nobody likes Henry. You're not meant to like Henry. Uh, do, do, do. Sorry, there are all these non sequiturs. What has been the no most difficult aspect of being a self-published writer? Everything's a learning curve, I suppose. Um, so I switched, or switched, I have done a lot of self-publishing recently because I had a gap in contract, so I had the time. Um, and I've been wanting to try it for much longer, actually. I just never had any time to spare on it. And I purposely took some time off to do it because of the control. So I'm a total control freak. Um, and a lot of things happen during the course of, you know, seven, eight years in traditional publishing that brought home to me the fact of how little control I have. Um, not just over the end product with things like typos or whatever, but um, also things like the Barnes & Noble um, debacle, which some of you went through with me, for which I apologize, but that that was rough. Um, and so I finally just said, okay, I'm going to try doing this on my own. Um, novellas seem to be the easiest way to do it because I know I can write them faster and get them out, move them faster. Then, And I also really love that link, then there isn't a traditional venue for it, really. There's a couple, but um, none that I would really like to publish with or who would, frankly, be very interested in my kind style of stuff. Uh, so, so one of the things that was hard to learn was that that control, which I was so yearning for, it's still not totally there. Like, I, I'm never going to have that much control, as much control as I want. That was, I think that was the biggest learning process for me. Like, I'm still going to be dealing with draft to digital, pushing something out to Barnes and Noble and not updating the description of the book for another for an additional week. And there's nothing I can do about that. And that's just the platforms relating to each other. Or um, the, the UI on Ingram Spark is so hard to deal with. And then convincing um, bookstores, brick and mortar bookstores that they yes, they maybe do want to carry an independently published book. You know, those kinds of things are things that I again don't have any control over. So it's just, I mean, I'm old enough now to have learned this lesson, <laughs> so I, I'm i getting there, uh, trying to learn to relax and <laughs> let go a little bit. It's hard when you're a perfectionist, you guys. Uh, 
Uh, the affectionate relationship between Lord Akeldama and Biffy. Yeah, that was really fun to write. But if you go back and reread those books, you'll see that there's not a, they don't get a lot of screen time, those two. Um, a lot of that affectionate relationship is, is I don't know, ten sentences or something in total. Um, which either speaks to you guys as my readers reading a lot into those ten sentences or me writing some very powerful ten sentences. I don't know which. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, I think Lord Akeldama does have ones he loves more than other, and I think Biffy was probably very, very easy to love in his way. Um, but don't worry, Biffy will be fine. We'll fix him. Will I ever go to the Far East? One of the things I like to do is take my characters to physical locations that I've actually been to or know a, a great deal about because I studied um, the sites there or something in my in my previous life. So I have never been to the Far East. I'm going to Singapore. And actually one of the things I'm going to do while I'm there is some on-the-ground research into what the island was like during the Victorian era because... Um, I would maybe like to take the Custer Protocol crew there. I'm not sure. I will see what I dig up, if there's some exciting things that happened during that time period that they could explore. Uh, but, I mean, Singapore is... It's, it's far -y. It's not all the way to Japan. <laughs> but... Um, and I, I love the idea of that because Singapore is a melting pot and it has so many different cultures. It'd be really fun to see what kind of different uh, supernaturals also congregated on that one island. Do Alexia, Ivy, and Genevieve ever realize they all know Sophronia? Do they? Do I remember right? Uh, <laughs> um, yes, you do remember right. They do all know Sophronia. Uh, the question is, how many characters can Gail write into her books that know Sophronia without realizing that everyone else knows Sophronia? And how much has Sophronia been mucking up everybody's lives in the background for the last 40 years? That's the real question. Uh, Sophronia is very, very good at her job. I'll put it that way. Uh, the Wicker Chicken. Yes, Ty is asking the same question. Um, does Alexia ever know? Don't know. Uh, the better question is, would Alexia ever care? Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's Alexia. She's kind of obtuse. How far into the future would I like the Parasol verse to go? Well, the book that's coming out in July is not Parasol verse, but it it could be. Um, it could be the future that shifts. So. Uh, in a roundabout way to answer the question, I uh, believe in the rebound effect of alternate history. So I believe that there's a single timeline that you could go and muck about with the history of the past, but that the history would eventually rescript itself to become the present. So uh, not like Back to the Future. The opposite of Back to the Future. The opposite being that you could go and muck around in, in the past, Marty McFly could, and nothing would ever change in the present or the future. Um, that is just one of my philosophies on time travel, uh, possibly because I'm an archaeologist, <laughs> so I think that the past is the past and it's set. Um, so a present day parasol verse would look a lot like this one in terms of all of the great wars would have occurred, um, the Cold War, so like a lot of major things would still have happened. Uh, the population would be similar and all those sorts of things. Uh, supernaturals might still exist, perhaps under a different context. So, in other words, the history of the supernatural in combined with the um, the history of reality, um, they would have meshed to each other. So, you know, if you had a great war, then you might also have a supernatural great war that's going on that, that affects their population and our populations at the same time. That sort of thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, everybody's talking about the grain Barnes and Noble. Yeah, the Barnes and Noble fail. That was rough, you guys. That was not a good time. In fact, I was looking at that video there uh I think Ty found it for me. There was a video that popped up on YouTube that um the 
it was Waistcoats and Weaponry in November of 2014, and uh, I was on tour for that book when Barnes & Noble decided not to ship the 500 that I had signed for them. And uh, there's a video of me doing a, uh, like a Q&A, a uh, live Q&A at the Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. And that was the, and I'm looking at this video and I'm like, well, it's your standard Gale Q&A, um, except my energy level is just like so low. I'm so much less animated and quieter than normal. It's really weird to see myself like that because I'm like, it almost doesn't look like me. It looks like sort of a robotic version of me. And I'm like, why was I so, like, had I, had I really been that, like, tired at the end of that tour and I realized that that was the day after I'd found out <laughs> so that was that you can kind of see the after effects of that thing that incident um which I prefer not to think about <laughs> does it a lily doesn't lily put teach me about letting go and having no control because she's in charge you guys my cat is trained uh, I'm that bad. She uh, she uses the human toilet, and uh, she has a set of commands. She can sit and fetch. She can jump on command. She comes when she's called. Like she's like a little puppy dog because I'm that kind of human being. Need more Sophronia. <laughs> Need more support. She got four books, you guys. That's a lot of wordage for one one of my characters. Um, Ty hopes that Ivy sticks around long enough to see Neon. I think Ivy may be single-handedly responsible for the 1980s fashion. Who else would you blame? She's certainly responsible for the like crazy freaking hats at the turn of the century. Um, if I could be a were creature, what would I be? Probably um, a shapeshifter. Uh, despite the pain although i do love fashion so the vampires have a certain appeal and they and they they live longer in my in my past but i i really like the idea of shape-shifting i've always loved the idea of shape-shifting i think that would be so much fun and i would opt for a mermaid if i had a choice or selkie or something uh, i've always wanted gills and to be able to breathe underwater other people when they ask for superpowers always want to fly and i always wanted my own set of gills um, because if I could just spend more time underwater, I'd be that much happier. I love swimming. So, Isaac, I think that also answers your question. Probably werewolf if I have to pick between the two mainstays, but I'd love to be a werecat, and that'd be really fun, too. Do I enjoy writing uh, Genevieve LeFou more as her younger self, her 30s or her 40s? That's an excellent question. I think I'm going to cop out and say I really loved writing her all different ways. Part of that's the POV switch as well. Um, I adore when I get to write a character that's seen through different other characters' point of views. So some of my favorite characters will reoccur simply as an opportunity for me to explore them with a different character's eyes. Um, so I think Vive, I think I really like her, if I have to pick, I'd say as her youngest self. Because it was bittersweet, and, you know, I do like torturing my readers a little bit. I am that much of an author. I mean, I'm never going to go all George R. R. Martin and start killing everybody on you just to see you suffer. But I do like seeing you suffer a little bit. <laughs> so, but it was, so it's kind of like, it has that, uh, like, picking at a scar or something feel when I'm, when I wrote Vive as this innocent 10-year-old girl... Um, who hasn't had her heart broken yet. And so that, I hope, gave my readers who'd already met her in the Parasol Protectorate the opportunity to see her as less of this kind of flirtatious, um, enigmatic, brilliant genius and more as this sort of slightly heartbroken, bitter woman who becomes what happens in Heartless. So, in other words, by seeing the reflection of Vive as this young, innocent, delightful, um, precocious girl, you can also see her, see what changed in her and what might have driven her to build the Octomaton and destroy half of London. Um, because, because she, because her child is stolen from her. <laughs> Primrose training Tashrit. Yeah. 
Poor Tasha, she's got no idea what she's in for if she keeps up with her pursuit. Jesse wants more soap. I love soap. Um, soap I would like to bring back, and you can probably guess, I think Ty probably has already guessed what role soap will fall into. Um, I don't know that he'll get a lot of face time. It's probably going to be referential. Uh, but for those of you who are perked up, you'll, you'll spot it. And then if I ever write that Sid Sidhek book, which is years in the future, you guys, but it's there. If I ever do write that book, uh, he'll reappear in that book as well. Will we see Viva Bunsen's? Probably not. Um, it's one of those things where I don't necessarily feel the need to revisit her at that age bracket. I think she teared it up and had a grand old time. Um, probably drove everybody crazy at the school for evil geniuses. <laughs> Some Amanda's now picturing Ivy with bright fuchsia eyeshadow and crimped hair and spandex leggings. Uh, sadly, Amanda, you have just described me in the 1980s. I actually used to color my crimped hair with a pink highlighter pen. Oh yes, not pretty, you guys. Not pretty. What character is the hardest for me to write? <sighs> Generally, any character that I don't have a good handle on is difficult until I have a handle on them. Um, so write, yeah. That's... So Genevieve, actually, when she first appeared, was pretty hard for me to write. Uh, and I've talked about it before, because when she first appears in Changeless, I, w I really wanted people to like her, but I also wanted her motives to be constantly in question. So I wanted Alexia to not trust her, but like her. which And I wanted the readers to kind of come along on that journey. So um, that was pretty hard to write. She was probably the most challenging character that I ever wrote um, up until that juncture. But mostly if a character is fighting with me, I know my character so well that if a character is fighting with me, it's usually because I don't know them well enough or I've put them in a situation they wouldn't get into or I'm trying to make them do something that they just wouldn't intrinsically do. And I know that makes me sound schizophrenic, <laughs> but I actually do think about my characters that way. Will Felicity ever get her just desserts? So I thought for a while about taking uh, the Custard Protocol crew to the U.S. Um, to Boston or something. Felicity ends up in, uh, in Boston, dominating Boston in high society and causing problems for everybody. Uh, at least that's how I imagined her. I don't know if that's really where she ended up. Um, I do have her in mind to bring back in maybe to the Custard Protocol books, but uh, so far it hasn't happened. Um, and I'm leery of going to the United, back to the United States for various reasons at this juncture, so I'm not sure it will happen. I'm more likely now to bring a uh, a U.S. character into England in a, a la Buccaneers, Edith Walton style. So, um, I don't know. Will Felicity? I think Fel I think Biffy booting her out of society pretty much um, ruined her life. So, for her, it was the worst thing that could possibly happen. Uh, I'm not going to answer that question. There's a couple questions in here that are too spoilery, so I'm not going to answer. Or I, or I just don't know. haven't decided yet. Well, we see more of Sidhag after we ask it. Sabrina is asking a question that um, we talked a little bit about in the last Q&A, but I have an idea to write her, Sidhag's story, um, as one of the delightfully deadly novellas, but it'll be in the future. It'll be a, a ways away uh, because it's going to be very, very complicated to write. And because Sidhag is one of the saddest stories in my universe. I mean, people feel sorry for, like, Biffy and, and Lyle, and but I always feel the most sorry for Sidhag. So, um... It would be difficult emotionally, strangely enough, for me to write her journey. Maybe I identify with her a little too closely. Um, so I'm not ready yet, uh, and I don't think the, the universe is ready. Speaking of the Octomaton, um, there's a line that says, it was the second one Genevieve built. What was the first? Um, initially, I had actually planned to put the first Octomaton in the, um, or the Octomaton, however you want to say it, in the Romancing the Inventor. But it didn't work out because Romancing and Vendor became this kind of cozy, gothic, um, single location story. Uh, so my, I actually wrote it into her timeline, so it may or may not be on the wiki. I might have not have put that part on the wiki, but it, it is, she did do it, um, and it was Paris. Um, so it was over, it was during her, or just after her, um, her education, yeah, over in, over in Paris. <laughs> uh, Joe wants to know what Romancing the Inventor is about. Uh, Romancing the Inventor is about a working class girl 
um, in the original sense of working class, <laughs> uh, who takes work at a vampire hive in order to be perverted because she thinks that she might be gay. And she thinks that the vampires could help her figure that out. And then falls in love with the inventor that the vampires are kind of keeping as a pet. Uh, and then we go from there. Amanda wants to know, what kind of situations have I had characters in that they wouldn't get into? Uh, and did you force it or change the situation? This sounds like a NaNoWriMo sort of question. Uh, so because I tend to outline very strictly... Most of the time my characters don't get into situations where I can't extract them out because I have a plan, usually, for whatever they get into. Uh, so if the character has gotten into a situation that the character can't handle, then I've messed up as an author, I'm going to have to go back and fix it. Or I put the wrong character into that situation, I have to go back and arrange it so someone else gets into it. Um, and I actually have done that, where I've like I've put Rue into a situation, for example, and I was like, no, Primrose is the one who can handle this, and I had to go back and, and fix that. Um, yeah, and and you can think of that for those of you who have the Harry Potter books as the Neville with the sword situation. So there's a reason in the J.K. Rowling, like thematically, but also, like, just as a writer, why she has Neville kill the snake with the sword, um, rather than Harry, and you, you need to use your, your side characters sometimes need to do the most heroic things, um, and I'm a particular fan of that kind of thing. Why didn't Imogen run into Lord A? I don't know, she just didn't. Um, she probably should have, because I like to joke that I put Lord Ockledom into all of my books, but didn't happen in the story. Um, how drastically the Genevieve redesign or redec- drastically. I, I wouldn't put past a three-wall remodel on her. Uh, poor Lyle. Uh, he did love that, Chad. Who gave Sophronia the codename Wicker Jicker? She chooses it herself. Um, I'm pretty sure. I don't remember. Someone who's more familiar with the finishing school, school books uh, at this juncture can handle can handle that question. But I think Sophronia chooses it. Uh, yeah, Jesse says it's hard to read Sitag in the finishing school books knowing what her future is. Yeah, it is hard. And I didn't really intend it to be that rough. Um, which is one of the reasons I want to revisit her. I don't like how sad her ending is. Although she does get ultimately what she wants, which is her pack. Um, and she is a good alpha, so it is the right choice. But um, is she happy? That is a good question. And I would like to go check in on her. Will the new Custard Protocol book still be from Rue's perspective? I don't think so. Uh, I haven't started writing them yet, so I haven't had the crystal clarity of the scene yet, as I talked about earlier. Um, but my intent at this point in time is to write the next one from Primrose's perspective. And it's a, a decision as to whether it's just going to be Primrose or if it's going to be a POV swap between Primrose and a different character. Maybe Primrose and Rue? I don't know. I haven't decided yet. Um, yeah, I need to think about that. It's one of the things I have slated perhaps to think about on an 18-hour flight to Singapore. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. Do I read my humorous passages to others to make sure they are, in fact, humorous? On occasion, not often. So I'm part of a writer's group, and um, a, a, I do a writing retreat once a year. And occasional, and one of the, the stipulations on that retreat is that we have to read out loud something that we wrote that day. There's no critique. It's just to prove that you actually wrote something. And I, when I'm on retreat... I'm very prolific, so I have way more than 10 minutes worth of stuff to read at the end of any given day. So I'll often choose a funny passage to read out loud to see if people are laughing and if the pulse beats are, are coming across. Um, I also have alpha readers who read specifically for humor. So I used to, they're, they're now pretty busy, but they, um, I used to have three women, old, old friends of mine, and they each have a different sense of humor, and they'll read my books, and I will look to make sure that there are little notations about laughter or amusement in all different colored pens. I give them each a different pen, different pen color, um, to, to make sure I'm hitting, like, different kinds of humor as often as possible. 
I don't get to do that as much as I used to because they have busy lives and they, they can't always uh, bow to my very uh, time-constrained schedule. But I still try and get um, beta readers or alpha readers to check. The humor is particularly important to me. Any plan to have any more stories set in France? Possibly. Uh, so I was just reading over the outline for Custer Protocol 3, and I had initially had them going to France in search of a hat. I don't know if that's still going to happen, actually, now that I, um, that outline was kind of notated and written before I had finished the end of, um, the end of Imprudence, and those of you who've written, read all the way to the very end of Imprudence, you know that there's a, a new, rather startling character introduced at the end who, who changes everything. So I might not be able to take them to France. <laughs> so, um, again, when some authors say they're character-driven, character, character -driven, my stuff is so character-driven that literally I introduce a new character and the whole plot for another book might have to change. Why didn't the vampires demolish Woolsey and build a new house? Because she got tethered to it. And I'm never quite sure if, like, the tether is to the actual, like, ground underneath a building or kind of weirdly into, like, the brick and mortar of the building of itself. But when the new queen occupied it, she occupied that house. So they couldn't, like, tear it down and rebuild it around her. Uh, they could maybe put up a facade all the way on the outside, and I wouldn't put it past them to do that kind of thing. But, um... Yeah, I don't know that they care what it looks like on the outside that much. The queen, after all, is only seeing the inside, so she just keeps changing the curtains with every season. Amber wants to know Primrose and Percy, and I think you're asking if the POV swap would be between the two of them, and the answer is it won't be Percy. It would be, Prim it would be Primrose and somebody else. Um, right now, my intent is to have Percy be the fourth book, um, or more properly, um, a new character come in who is meant for Percy to be the fourth book. Will the future Custer Protocol books be self-published as well, or will I continue traditional? Well, right now the intent is to continue traditional. Um, it's really, really challenging to switch publishers midstream and or take up the gauntlets and, and self-publish midstream um, unless there's a, a, an incredibly good reason. And I do, I do like my publisher. I have a very good relationship with my publisher. So I... And you get, you know, honestly, you get better distribution and you get into all bookstores and that kind of thing if you have a traditional publishing contract. So uh, it would be better for you guys if the novels were were um, traditionally published. So that's the intent. Fingers crossed. Kitty's saying that a writer's group is, yeah, uh, I agree from a, from an authorial perspective standpoint, a critique group or a writer's group is not something that I'm actually a big fan of. Um, I think it really depends. For some people, they're incredibly healthy. If you get the right group, it's good, but um, sometimes other authors want to change your intrinsic voice too much, or if you're not strong enough or confident in yourself, you get railroaded really easily. I do think it's a good idea to practice reading your stuff out loud, even if it's only into an empty room. Um, and I do think it's a good idea to get yourself used to criticism. But also, you know, part of part and parcel of being an author, especially if you intend to publish and put your work out there, is learning to hold the line when you're really confident in what you've written and learning to take suggestions for the part that you know you need work on. Um, and developing that sort of critical eye, but also that confidence in yourself um, is a skill that a lot of us authors like work hard on and are constantly kind of morphing and changing and, and learning more about. But I think the terror that most of us face up to when we think about a critique group is both the terror of, of people hating your stuff, but also the terror of being told to change something when it's wrong, when the, the, the recommendation is wrong, and you know it in your gut, and you're going to have to stand there and fight for it. Um, and that makes critique groups kind of terrifying. Do I intend to have Percy come off as ace? No. Um, Percy's just... putts. <laughs> Percy's just challenging. Uh, I think he's probably straight. Um, just exhausted by women. <laughs> I guess that would... Just, he's just Ivy's 
male offspring, poor thing. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I have contemplated writing an ace character, but I feel incredibly challenged by that. And so it's one of those things that, like writing romance or writing nookie scenes, um, will I face up to the challenge and, like, go up to bat for it? Or will I avoid it like the plague? Uh... Yeah, and again, like with anything, I think the character has to speak to me. So if an ace character comes into my head and wants to be written about, then I'll write them. But no, I don't think Percy is, the, I don't think Percy is that character, but he hasn't spoken very confidently to me yet. He's, he's kind of in the background. I mean, I know him, but he's mostly in the background at the moment. Joe wants to know which women writers do I admire or inspired you to become a writer? Well, Tamora Pierce is my favorite author. I've talked about that before. Um, favorite in terms of she was very, very, very inspiring to me because when she wrote, I was eight when the first Alana book came out, and that was the first book I had ever read. I'd read a lot of science fiction and fantasy. My my mom raised me on Tolkien, but that was, she's British, uh, The Water Babies, um, Son of British, uh, Wind and Willows, Tom's Midnight Garden, things like that. Um, but Tamara Pierce's Alana was the first book where a woman or a girl was the central character. Um, and a powerful, um, badass girl who worked really hard to achieve her ends. Um, and it basically blew my eight-year-old brain wide open um, and made me realize all of these things about reading and writing. And yeah, so very, very formative for me. But I, I mean, I think I've been influenced by a lot, a lot of women writers over the years who inspired me to become a writer. So I never thought I would be a writer. Um... I grew up in a community full of poets and artists, and they never ate properly and never had any money, so I thought that's a terrible, terrible career. Uh, so I never intended to be a writer, I just always liked writing. Um, and I figured if I wrote th something, I might as well see if I can get it published. Um, and then a friend of mine got published, so I realized that real human beings were actual like fantasy authors. That was pretty exciting. Um, but yeah, I'm still startled. <laughs> and this is where I ended up after being so confident that it was such a terrible idea. Um, hate being a vampire queen. I uh, like to get out and about. Yeah, being a vampire queen is pretty tough. I mean, that tether is solid. So unless you go bonkers and um, insane, then... Yeah, you are tethered to your spot. Um, all right, guys. Well, I think we're running up on an hour, so we should probably wind this down. I'm going to scan through and see if there are any final questions I didn't get to, but don't ask any more, okay? And then if some of you want to jump over to the Squee group, we'll do a real quick, like, spoiler, spoiler, spoilers. But, um... <laughs> Ty is correcting me that I that one can be straight and ace, which is one of the many reasons that I'm leery about writing a character like that, because I just don't want to be jumped all over by the internet. Like, it's just exhausting. I, and I'm not sure I'm ready to fight that battle. It might be someone else's battle to fight. What frequently used plot devices... Valerie wants to know, which is one of my favorite questions in the universe, what frequently used plot devices do I loathe? And I can tell you in a frickin' nutshell that it's the hero's journey. I hate the hero's journey. I hate it so hard. <laughs> like, I just am so exhausted by it. Um, yeah, the one person against the universe conquering all. The idea that, like, there's some noble, um, glorious, masculine ideal of one person achieving against all odds without help is disgusting. And has probably ruined uh, society as we know it, if you ask me. And all men, frankly. Like, it's okay to have connections and build networks and ask for help. And that's not weak. And until the hero's journey dies, we will, we will never get over that. And it's there. <laughs> all right, guys. I'm going to go. I, we're, we're freezing up. I'm going to go over to the squee. Uh, now that I've had my little rant <laughs> at the end, anybody who makes it through can see Gail get angry about the hero's journey. Um... It's been awesome talking to you guys. We will do this again sometime. Not for a little while, though, because it's going to be... Um, it's 
It's gonna be Singapore and then the holidays, so. But I will talk to you again soon. Oh, and this is your reminder. I have so much stock to get rid of in my uh, office that I'm gonna be doing a lot of giveaways on the newsletter. So if you don't get the cheer up, you should get the cheer up so I can give you books. All right. <laughs> Bye.